I think I was first at this podium nine years ago this week. And um, when I came here, you know, I had known Wyatt um, some years earlier at Virginia Tech and Barbara. And I'd met Jill once, and I think I'd met Dick once. I didn't know anybody. And I had no idea that I was about to um, meet all the most important people in the world. Um, because except for my wife and kids, um, pretty much the people I care most about are, are folks I met here. Um, so I'm very, very honored to be back here again. Um, I'm getting to teach with Bobby Ann Mason, who, when I was in grad school, changed the way I thought about everything, about stories and place, and um, kind of having to pinch myself. And there she is, <laughs> right next to me. And thank you, Adam and Megan and all of these great staff members um, who are tremendously talented writers themselves. You know, we, we talk about the community of writers here. And um, I, I will just tell you something that happened to me here three years ago. It was one of the um, most important experiences I ever went through as a writer. Um, I had just started writing this novel, The Unmade World. And I got up and read um, the opening pages about 30 pages, actually. About 10 pages in, I started realizing everything that was wrong <laughs> with what I had written. And honestly, <laughs> if I could have departed right then, <laughs> I, I might have done it. But I, I soldiered on um, the, and resisted the temptation to pick the pen up and start editing. And I actually, um, I was so distraught that the next day, um, which was the last day of the conference, I was driving away and, and I sent Tony early a text and I said, Tony, should I quit writing that novel? And Tony wrote me back. I don't think he remembers this. He said, brother, only you can answer that question. But I will make the observation that I don't think you've quite got the right perspective yet on your main character. And it was one of the more important things anybody ever said to me. Um, I think we get the notion that, that the community part of it is the faculty offering advice um, to the people in the workshops. But I've seen people come through these workshops who are my colleagues now, and um, you know, maybe they were unknown when they first showed up here, but they're very important writers, and I've gotten advice from them as well. So. Um, it's really, it's really fabulous to be a part of this. This book is dedicated to Jill McCorkle um, because she's one of those people who's always been there for me. Since I'm not reading from the front, I've got to do that whole business of telling you what you would know if you had read the front. And then um, I'm going to start reading from the second section probably for about 30, 35 minutes. So my main character, Richard, is a Polish-American who covers Central California for the Los Angeles Times. Um, two and a half years earlier, while on a visit to Poland, where he and his wife have an apartment, um, he has gotten involved in an accident that cost him um, his family. And uh, it was a result of a, of a chance encounter on a snowy road with um, a Polish criminal, who is the other point of view character that we follow off and on throughout the novel. Richard, the main character, um, mostly remembers this man looking through the shattered um, glass and leaving him there to die with his wife and daughter. And he's haunted by that image. So where we pick up, um, this has all happened to him two and a half years earlier. Some of the people who are mentioned here, Monica is his sister-in-law. She's married um, to Richard's wife's brother, Stefan, who is um, a bad but successful Polish crime novelist. Uh, and, and Monica is a classical musician. And someone who is mentioned here is a detective named Malinowski, or Malinowski as it would be, who Stefan has actually based his fictional characters on. Um, and then Franek, 
is Stefan's son, Stefan and Monica's son, and he has gotten in trouble and is about to be sent to Fresno, California to clean up his act. So I'll start from here. If you walked across the yard this morning and peeked through the bay window, you might think you were seeing a man who's been banished from his matrimonial bed. Otherwise, why would he be balled up on the living room sofa, his long legs drawn toward his chest? It wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that he came home late last night with lipstick on his collar, reeking of sex and perfume, or that at the very least he stayed out with his buddies and drank too much. Or maybe he simply sat there by himself and got shit-faced, though there's no bottle nearby or glass either. And since there's only one car in the driveway, odds are he's nobody's guest. You'd all but have to believe he'd done something wrong to put himself where he is, this middle-aged man sleeping alone on the sofa in a three-bedroom house on a quiet California street. The day will begin and end with phone calls. When the first one comes, he's still asleep. It's the landline, which he usually unplugs on his way to the bedroom, but it turns out he's not in the bedroom. At first, he doesn't know what he's doing on the couch. Then he remembers watching the Red Sox square off against the A's. At least this time, he turned off the TV before curling up. The closest phone is on the wall in the kitchen. When he lifts the receiver, he hears Monica clearing her throat. She does this at the beginning of every call. A couple of times he's thought about asking if she's aware of it. Richard, she says, as if anyone else could possibly be answering the phone at his house. Hi, Monica. I know it's still early there, and I'm sorry if I woke you. That's okay, I needed to get up anyway. I'm by myself right now, and I just wanted to mention a couple of last-minute things. He's standing in the breakfast alcove where he seldom eats breakfast anymore. On the other side of the driveway, in the almost identical tutor that belongs to Bob and Sue Lines, he sees their daughter, Sandy, sitting at the kitchen table, staring at her laptop while she eats from a bowl of cereal. In the fall, she'll be a senior, the other day, her dad told him that while she's planning to apply to Berkeley and UCLA and a few other state schools, she'll choose Stanford if she gets in. He turns away from the window, steps up to the counter, and punches a button on the coffee maker. This time, he's the one who needs to clear his throat. Sure, he says, go ahead. She tells him that last week, Franick disappeared for more than 24 hours, during which he sent both her and Stefan numerous text messages, first begging them to let him remain in Krakow, then threatening not to come home unless they gave in. Fortunately, she says, Stefan's friend at the police department agreed to put a trace on his mobile, and they were able to locate him. Where was he? She's silent for a moment. He was over at your place, she says. I keep the keys on a peg in the pantry, and I didn't realize they were gone. I'm sorry. It's all right, he says, though it isn't quite. We went over everything with him again, and I think he finally understands that he's not being punished, that we're acting in his best interest, or at least trying to. But because he's always liked and trusted you, he may bring up the episode, so I wanted to let you know ahead of time. Okay, he says, I appreciate it. If it does come up, I think I can handle it. The other thing is to just remind you to be careful with your computer, banking, credit cards, and things like that, because, well, you know what happened. What happened is that Franick stole his parents' bank Polsky password and transferred several hundred zotties to his weed source on a day when his mother happened to log into one of their savings accounts and notice the debit. This led to the discovery of six previous transfers that had gone undetected because when you have as much money as they do, a few hundred here and there don't necessarily attract your attention. They're sending him a 15-year-old delinquent, hoping that a change in environment will help straighten him out. Richard's first inclination when they broached the possibility was to say no. 
It was swiftly superseded by the awareness that both Yulia and Anna would have wanted him to say yes. I'll be careful, he tells her. When I need to pay a bill, I usually just write a check. I'm fairly low tech. Yes, I know, but he's not. <laughs> By the way, I'm sure he looks at pornography, too. Does that concern you? She laughs dryly. Not as long as he doesn't look at the wrong kind. How have you been, Richard? Over the past two and a half years, she's called him every few weeks to pose some version of that question. Sometimes Stefan talks to him too, sometimes not. Either way, hers is the voice he looks forward to. It has a soothing quality he was previously unaware of. I'm hanging in there, he tells her. Though he would not suspect it, she's standing in Franick's bedroom. Her son is at a cafe having a going away chat with his father. His bags are packed and they're full of those things you can get with money the latest MacBook Pro, the newest iPod, noise-canceling headphones that cost what some people earn in a month, numerous pairs of slacks and designer jeans, tailored shirts, a cashmere dressing gown that Stefan picked up for him in Copenhagen as if it will ever be cold enough in Fresno, California for Frantic to put it on. She sits down on his bed, which is twice the size of the one she used to share with her sister. Everything is bigger now, and there's so much more of it, so many different ways to anesthetize yourself. Hanging in there is all any of us can do, isn't it, she says. I guess so. Monica. She knows what he's about to ask her. The question is always the same, and so is her answer. Did you have a chance to drop by the cemetery? Yes, I did. Early last week, I left fresh roses in both vases. There's a moment of transatlantic silence. Then he asks, was Stefan able to talk to his detective friend, see if he turned up anything new? To be honest, Richard, he hasn't. I reminded him of it, but he went to Denmark for the book release, and then Franick disappeared, and he had to call Malinowski to help find him, but I will bring it up with him again soon. Now I need to get ready for this evening's performance. Please ring me the moment Franick comes off the plane. Will you do that for me? Of course I will, he promises, then tells her not to worry. After they've said goodbye, he finishes the first cup of coffee, then pours himself another and goes outside where he sits on the steps for nearly an hour, staring at his lone sequoia. He puts on a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and his Nikes and leaves the house on foot, walking up Maroa toward the gym. It's not yet nine o'clock, but already the temperature is close to 100, that dry, baking valley heat that has never quite come to seem normal. He spends 45 minutes on the treadmill, working the speed up to six miles per hour, the fastest he can go without breaking into a jog. He's not supposed to run anymore. Twice over the last couple of years, his knees got so badly inflamed that he was forced to spend three or four days slugging back ibuprofen. On the treadmill, he drives himself relentlessly, and as a result, he's down to 185 pounds. It's not the weight loss he's after. It's the adrenaline. When he's finished, he walks back home, takes a cool shower, gets dressed, and climbs into the car. He drives out to a farm just east of Kingsburg between Route 99 and the Sierra foothills. It's owned by a man named Jim Swenson. Eighteen years ago, one of his three children, an 11-year-old boy, died of cancer. Back then, Swenson was raising table grapes, using plenty of chemicals like almost everybody else. But after his son's death, he became a pioneer in clean farming. On the side, he's a landscape painter whose work has been exhibited in galleries and museums all over the state and even beyond. Richard wrote an article about him in 93, and for a while after that, they kept in touch. He's going to talk to him today because last week he learned that the farm is being auctioned. Swenson answers the door. He looks exactly as Richard remembers, a short, compact man whose smooth face is unusually pale, given how much time he spends outside. Hi, he says, can I help you? This happens all the time. People he used to know no longer recognize him. 
I'm Richard, he says, offering his hand. Swenson recovers as best he can. You're sure looking trim. Must have been working out. And trying not to be such a pig at the table. Thanks for agreeing to see me again, Jim. Swenson leads him into the living room, which hasn't changed much either. He finds the same claw and ball feed and irons before the same small fireplace, several overflowing bookcases, including a couple of shelves worth of Wendell Berry, a pie chest that he had referred to in his article, noting that it had once belonged to Swenson's great-grandmother. Two sofas face each other over the coffee table. His host gestures at one and takes a seat on the other. So what can I tell you, he asks. Pulling out his notepad, Richard says that when he learned about the auction, he was both disturbed and surprised. The last I heard, things were going really well for you. Mind if I ask what happened? Swenson locks his hands behind his head. We're in the third straight year of drought. Priority water rights holders are still getting 100% of their normal allotment. Last year, we got 30. This year, we're getting 10. There's no more to be had, and even if there was, we wouldn't be able to afford it. But really, that's just part of the problem. He says that he's had to borrow more and more money to stay in business, and the only reason he didn't reach this day a lot sooner is his income from painting. I'm not exactly Thomas Kincaid, but my stuff sells for decent sums. It can probably continue to sustain my wife and me if we live modestly enough, but it can't sustain this place. What do you think will happen to it? The land? It'll be bought by an agribusiness conglomerate, ConAg, Archer Daniels, one of those. Am I right in thinking this must be costing you a lot of grief? I wouldn't say it meets the grief standard. Grief's what you feel when somebody you love dies. He says his failure to achieve long-term success doesn't necessarily pretend failure for anyone else that he still thinks clean farmers with know-how and commitment can make a go of it. Of course, they'll need a little luck, he says. Nobody can, su su can succeed in farming without that. For a man on the verge of losing everything but his house and his vehicle, he remains remarkably upbeat. He says he'll have a lot more time to paint, that he wants to explore mixed media techniques, that he's developed enthusiasm for the works of newer artists like Soraya French and Sarah Knight. Richard arranges for his photographer to visit the next day. Before he leaves, they stroll through a peach orchard. I'm not going to deny being sad about having to throw in the towel, Swenson admits, but all things considered, I'm pretty fortunate. I've still got most of my family and friends, and I've still got my painting. For a lot of people in my shoes, the end is just the end. What's left of their lives turns into a long, dismal slog. He pulls a plump Alberta off a branch, polishes it on his shirt front, and hands it to Richard. After that, he can't see going straight home. He drives up into the foothills, stopping on the roadside two or three times for no particular reason. Right now, there's not a lot to look at except some sagebrush and honey mesquite. Whenever he and his family came up here together, Yulia noted how dry and brown the landscape appeared so different from southern Poland. By mid-afternoon, he's at a quarter tank, so he turns and heads back down. In Fresno, he buys gas and stops at Subway to eat a sandwich. Then it's time to go home and perform the task he's been dreading. The middle bedroom is his study, which he used to share with Yulia, her desk facing the window, so she could gaze at her garden, his facing the wall to avoid distraction. He considered turning it into Franick's bedroom and moving his workspace into Anna's room. But he's been writing in the same place for nearly 20 years, and it's one thing that needs to remain unchanged. So he bought eight large plastic containers at Target, brought them home, and stacked them in the basement. Now he carries them all into the hallway. He pulls the lid off the first one and opens the door to his daughter's bedroom. 
He starts by removing the photos from the walls and bookshelves. Anna, hunkering before a toy refrigerator. Part of a kitchen set they gave her on her third birthday when she was in what she would later refer to as my 1950s housewife phase. The refrigerator was about three feet high, made of hard plastic and lacking any source of electricity. She cracked four or five eggs, dumped them into a toy skillet, and left the skillet inside it while they went for a week to Yosemite. <laughs> when they got back, you could smell rotten eggs from the driveway. Anna on stage in Palo Alto at the Young Artist Competition, her face serene as she bows her way through the second movement of Szymanowski's first violin concerto. She won the bronze medal. Anna curled up with his father on the couch in Massachusetts. She always called him Jadik, never grandfather. Anna wrapped tightly in a blanket, only her wizened face and one tiny fist visible as her mother holds her moments after giving birth. He doesn't even look at the last few photos, just removes them and places them in the container. Next, he goes to work on the books. Agatha Christie, Toby Janssen, Astrid Lindgren, and though he once observed that they didn't jibe with her other choices, Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove novels. Cowboys, she responded, are my weakness. <laughs> he thought the line was original, but it turns out there's a book of short stories on her shelf with that sentence for a title. A tidbit to savor when it seemed none were left. The process ought to take days, weeks, months, years, a lifetime. Instead, it consumes less than three hours. He carries the containers one by one back into the basement. Then he returns to her room where he puts fresh sheets on the bed for frantic, places a light comforter and a cover and a pair of pillows in their slip cases. By now it's 8.30 and he knows he ought to eat but doesn't feel like preparing anything or going out for dinner. And anyhow, he's not hungry. He crawls into bed with an Alan First novel that he's already read twice and manages 30 or 40 pages before falling asleep. When his cell rings, it's almost midnight. The name on the screen is that of his best local cop shop contact, a detective in the Fresno PD named Joe Garcia. Brennan? He can hear out of sync sirens in the background. Then he realizes that at least one of them is actually close by, that it sounds like it's speeding south on Maroa. Yeah, hi, Joe. Listen, you need to hurry down to, what's the fucking address down here? He hears the detective holler. Then 236 Peshaw. That's near Calway Elementary? Not too far. It's behind a row of body shops, which is kind of ironic now that I think about it. What's up, Joe? What you got? Garcia makes a spitting sound. A slaughterhouse, he says. A boxy little prefab structure with a flat roof, iron bars over the windows and doors. It reminds him of houses he's seen in the Caribbean. At first he thinks it's made of concrete, but Garcia says lathe and stucco. No AC, Richard asks. Just a fucking swamp cooler, but that's not even working. The detective, who's about 40 and nearly as tall as he is, wipes sweat off his forehead. His shirt is soaked. They're standing in the street just outside the taped off area, surrounded by police cars, ambulances, fire trucks, and a KSFN action news van, as well as 30 or 40 neighbors whose toes and necks are being subjected to undue stress. More people are streaming onto the block from both ends. Some are wearing pajamas or nightgowns. One elderly man has ventured out in his boxers. We had to use a plasma cutter to get in, Garcia tells him. It was around 120 degrees in there. Any idea how long ago it happened? Not that long, and praise Jesus and Bill O'Reilly, because otherwise, in such heat, he shakes his head. How many people are we talking about, Joe? The detective glances across the street and sees something he doesn't like. 
Before turning away, he says, five, counting the one with the gun, but you didn't hear it from me. We talking men, women, children? We talking I gotta go, he says over his shoulder, joining a gaggle of cops and crime lab techs. The woman he apparently left to avoid is tall and slim, a bit north of 30, if Richard were to guess, with thick reddish hair that sweeps across the shoulders of her burnt orange blouse. He's never really met her, though he saw her a couple weeks ago out at Corcoran State Prison after the news leaked that numerous inmates, including Charles Manson, had somehow acquired cell phones. She recently joined the staff of the Fresno Sun. Her hiring caught his attention because she used to work for the Worcester Morning Journal, where his former BU classmate is executive editor. He's read two or three of her pieces, and she knows what she's doing. She puts her hand out. We haven't been introduced, she says, but I've been hoping to meet you. I'm Maria Cantrell. Her palm is damp on a night like this. Whose wouldn't be? Richard Brennan, he says. The legendary Richard Brennan. Alex said to tell you hello. How's he doing? Ad revenues drying up, circulations plummeting, you know, but hey, what are we going to do? As soon as she opened her mouth at the Corcoran press conference, he knew she was not a native New Englander. Texas, he would guess, probably the hill country. You don't sound like you're from Boston, he says. She laughs, you don't either, though I know you are. I grew up in Arkansas. Did you go to the University of Arkansas? A friend of mine teaches journalism there. I went to Lake Village High. I never made it to college. He senses she's waiting for a reaction to this last piece of information. If so, she'll be disappointed. Was it my imagination, he asked, or was Joe Garcia in a hurry to get away from you? I interviewed him a few days ago about a cold case. Something he was involved in? Yeah. Looks like your dredging may have caused a little discomfort. He actually brought the case to my attention. Oh, well... Joe's his own private press agent. He can be useful, but I've got him marked handle with care. I told him I'm not seeing any story right now, and he acted pissed. Then the next morning, he phoned and invited me out for a drink. Just so you know, he's married. She laughs again. Just so you know, I do know, and I said no. (laughs) The gurneys began to roll out the front door. The lumps in the first couple of body bags are far too small. Oh my God, she says, those are children. The asphalt they're standing on is sticky. He lifts one foot and then the other, focusing on the suction, the tactile sense of it, the auditory. In another hour or so, when it cools down into the 80s, the surface of the streets will recover their firmness. There will be something solid and dependable to stand on. The EMTs load the gurneys into the backs of ambulances and they pull away from the curb, sirens ominously silent, flashers turned off. An FPD spokesman faces the television lights and reads a prepared statement, which essentially says nothing. In the morning, they'll hold the press conference, though when it will be, he doesn't yet know. Next, the DA steps up before the lights and says his own bit of nothing, and the crowd begins to straggle away. Richard tells Maria Cantrell good night, and she says that sometime soon she'd love to have coffee with him, let him bring her up to speed on the Central Valley, since Alex told her he knows more about it than anybody else. He says, sure. Instantly forgetting the promise, as well as the person he made it to, and moving off to accost as many neighbors as he can before they disappear inside their houses, turn out their lights, and bar their doors. Family name, Aguilera. They'd lived there for two years. The husband, Andreas, in his mid-30s. He worked at one of the nearby body shops. The wife, nobody knows her first name or where she worked, or if they do, they're not saying though everybody agrees she had a job of some sort and was often gone at night. Three kids, one girl and two boys, 
the youngest a toddler, the oldest around seven. An old lady came over most evenings, but nobody knows her name either, and descriptions of her differ. Driving home, he turns the air on full blast. In his study, he slams out 12 inches and emails the piece, then strips naked and climbs into the shower, turning it on as hot as he can tolerate, letting it pound his back and shoulders. Then he turns it all the way to cold, which isn't that cold, and stands there until the heat in his body starts to dissipate. He towels off, puts on a fresh pair of underwear, and steps into the backyard. It's around 3 a.m., maybe a quarter past. His hands are balled into fists, and he's seeing that face looking in through the shadowed window of the crumpled Mercedes. Weak chin, thin lips, small eyes, odd mole. It's as if nature chose not to waste time on the man's features, knowing something more essential was missing inside. He sits down on the still warm ground, then he leans back, his knees raised, and looks at the sky. Despite the haze in the air, he can see a few points of light. Science was never his strong suit. He knows next to nothing about the constellations, can't recall more than a handful of names, Cassiopeia, Canis Major and Minor, Andromeda, Orion. At random, he picks a pair of stars that look fairly close together. And though he knows they must be light years from each other and even farther from him, he stares at them until his hands and legs begin to relax and his pulse starts to slow. Like a patient prepped for surgery, he takes a final breath and falls asleep. Mr. Brennan? Mr. Brennan? At first, he doesn't know where he is or why Sandy Lyons would be bending over him in her nightgown, her hair down in her eyes. Nor does he know that he's not wearing anything but his underwear. <laughs> Once this has all become clear, he masters the impulse to leap off the ground and cover as much of himself as he can. Instead, he slowly rises to a sitting position, holds it for a beat, then plants a hand and pushes himself up. I guess I gave you a fright, didn't I? He asked, slapping dirt off his palms like he just slid into second. Well, she says, I thought maybe you had a heart attack. You didn't, did you? Not in the traditional sense. <laughs> did you maybe drink too much or something? Not that either. There used to be a redwood fence between his house and hers, but because she and Anna were such close friends, he and Bob Lyons spent a Saturday afternoon nine or ten years ago sipping beer and knocking it down. He glances across the backyard and sees both Bob's and Sue's cars parked in the driveway. Neither has left for work yet and could well be watching while he stands here in his underwear talking to their teenage daughter. <laughs> as casually as circumstance allows, he says, What time is it, Sandy? About a quarter after six. You're up kind of early, aren't you? I went to get a drink of water and saw you through the window. It sure is sweet of you to check on me. <laughs> she looks at his compressor, which rests on a slab near the back door and is drowning away. Is your air conditioner okay? Yeah, hon, it's fine. Um, I had to go cover a really disturbing event last night, which I'm sure you can read about in this morning's sun. And I just needed to lie down for a while and gaze at the sky, and I guess I got a little too comfortable. Isn't this the day your nephew's coming? It sure is. What's his name again? Frannick. Uh, he may want to go by Frank here. I don't know. My mom said you asked if I could talk to him about school. I told her I'd be glad to, though several of the sophomore teachers are new, and I never had classes with them. I appreciate that, Sandy, he says, and I know he will as well. He's coming for the whole year or just the fall semester? Probably just the fall. We'll have to wait and see. He'll actually be arriving right after lunch, and I've got a good bit to do before picking him up. So why don't you and I both go back inside before your folks wake and begin to wonder if I've lost my mind? <laughs> okay, she says. She turns and takes a couple of steps toward her back door. 
then turns again. Before he knows what's happening, and perhaps before she does, she's thrown her arms around him, her breath tickling his chest. She lets go of him as quickly as she grabbed him, then slings her hair out of her eyes, walks across the yard, and disappears inside. Thanks. <laughs>